paper. Right. Because you're getting that warmth, the warm color yeah, coming in. You can see that. It just feels like light. I'm Carol Newborg, and I'm the program manager for Arts and Corrections here at San Quentin. I've been working with Arts and Corrections since 1984 because it's always fascinating. I'm always inspired. I, I meet people that might come in here and be sort of closed down, and then I see them as they get into the art and find ideas. It, helps people change and grow and develop self-awareness and it, it inspires me to see the kind of change that people can make. Right now I'm doing these, this dot or stippling. Uh, I'm doing another watercolor. Uh, you have to change the medium so there's a different way you have to approach that piece. So it'd be like in life I'm putting too much stress or too much focus. Maybe I need to refocus and give you an opportunity to present you know, your situation and then say, aha, it's not an uh-oh moment anymore, it's an aha moment. There's brilliant artists here. I mean, I relate to them as in, oh my God, this is intimidating. There's so much talent here, there's so much intelligence. You know, given room and opportunity to grow, it's, it's just mind-boggling. Prison is a lot about taking your humanity. Restorative justice is first about making the person feel human again. In choir, you're not viewed as an offender, you're viewed as a person. In the field of community music, we practice the theory of the welcome and hospitality. 93% of the 8,000 some inmates that are in prison will someday walk out. The real measure of our success isn't what happens on the inside, it's what happens when they go to the outside. Half of the choir is made up of outside volunteers and half of the choir is inside. If you walked by, you wouldn't know which ones of us are incarcerated and which ones of us are leaving in a few hours. At first it wasn't for me. I wasn't going to go, I wasn't going to get into it. But then I met Dr. Cohen and she encouraged me to at least try songwriters. And wrote a song and she liked it and people liked it. Let's crack the sky. Let's crack the sky. The field of music education is at a place where we want to start to expand how music education can impact human lives in a positive way. I've been in the choir about eight years. The people that were there, they were my visits. They were my weekly visit. It's changed people's perception of what prison is. I got the chance to meet a world-famous choir and sing with them. I got to meet Maggie Wheeler and sing with her and perform one of her songs. And that's all due to Warden McKinney allowing more and more things to come in for rehabilitation and not just punishment. You know, you're in prison, you have life, but the gang life, that's not who you are. And when you come to a camp like this and see the choir, and see how open it is, you start to feel human again. This is the first prison I've ever been in where there's more positive going on than negative. And that's a heck of a thing for a prison. For many years as a teacher of literature, I 
was trying to create a classroom which felt alive to me and authentic. And these are the kinds of things that we talk about in this program. We use literature as an opportunity to talk about life issues that are relevant to all of us that are universal. If you boil it down to the most essential element, this is a class in which two groups of young people, the same age, 18 to 21, one group from a university, the other group from a correctional center, come together, sit down side by side and have conversations about life through literature. When I walked into that building every Tuesday afternoon, it's like I wasn't locked up. It's like for the next three hours, I can live, I can do me, I can be myself, I can open up. It's not often that you spend 90 minutes talking about the things that you're the most scared of or the people that you love the most or, you know, like what you want to do with your life and what you've done wrong with your life. I was expecting them like to come in here like be scared or look down on us like, yeah, they're criminals. I didn't expect for us to be able to connect like our life is the same. Some like in some ways we had to struggle with the same problems. The students and the residents grapple together and they realize it doesn't matter if you're a 20-year-old college student or a 20-year-old youth, you know, in a correctional center. You know what it feels like to lose someone you love. You know what it feels like to struggle with family situations. You know what it feels like to try to search to find your place in a world that doesn't always make that easy. Those are the issues of Russian literature, and those are universal. I have found that they connect with these themes at a visceral level. They know what it means to lose their freedom. That's not an abstract question to them. They're incarcerated. And it's incredibly valuable for them to be able to talk about that theme through a story from their own experience and then share that with the students. So students come away with a totally new understanding of that whole converse, of that whole theme in Russian literature. A lot of these stories really have helped me realize, you know, a lot of inner issues that I've been dealing with my whole life that I really couldn't quite piece together in words until I heard it in the story and then it would say it and I'd be like, that kind of reminds me of myself, you know? And I'll think about it and then I'll start thinking, well, I need to work on that. And then I'll work on it and then it'll just get better and then eventually it's just not even a problem anymore. Oh, he's a, he's an author. He's a, more than that, he he's inspires us. Louis, he comes in here and it gives us a moment of freedom. He's our window. We look through him to see how the world is and he looks at us and sees how the world is. He's an amazing human being. You know, he's, he's very thoughtful. He's supportive of everybody. You know, he's willing to give a man a break no matter what his background may be at all times. He's a great individual and um, we need more of him. I wasn't scared straight, I was scared straight. Somebody cared for me, you know what I'm saying? I wasn't really scared of prison or dying. I wasn't scared of heroin. I wasn't scared of getting shot. I didn't care about those things. Especially for me to get into arts and corrections, it had to do with the fact that I was a troubled young man. And I was in that world where a lot of these guys that you see now in prison, I, I was in that world. Uh, the difference, of course, was I felt like I was very blessed and fortunate that I had mentors and people who cared enough for me because uh, I don't think I would have been that much different. I was in the gang, I was using heroin, I was in and out of jails, I was a juvenile hall. But I loved to draw, I loved to write. I would go to that library downtown. It was my refuge. I loved those books and I read all those books. It's kind of hard to be a heroin addicted youth in the streets, homeless. And then years later, I was given the Poet Laureate Award right there at the same library by Mayor Eric Garcetti. To me, they're blessings. I'm not any better than anybody. That's one thing I always knew. I'm not better than my homies that didn't make it or the guys that I'm teaching in prison. I'm not. I'm very fortunate, but I got to do something with what I've been given. And I feel that that's my obligation to give back and to keep showing how valuable these human beings are, no matter what their circumstances. Because I was one of those people that people were throwing away and they shouldn't have done it to me. They shouldn't do it to them. So to me, writing brings us together. That's what I've been trying to show these past few weeks. And uh, brings you together, but also allows you to connect with others. Among the Mayan, there's a saying, in Lakesh, in Lakesh Halakan, which means, I am the other you, you are the other me. It's a beautiful concept. 
you know, you greet people like this. We are the mirrors to each other. And almost all native peoples have those kind of greetings. It's among my mother's tribe in uh, Raramuri and Chihuahua, they say Guirawa. Guirawa means we are one. Language is probably one of the oldest traditions in all humanity. These days, I'm focused on the art of rehabilitation and alchemy into the best version of myself that I've ever been. Dynamic in every dimension. Empathetic enough to champion the rights of victims. Still, conscious enough to advocate for the abolishment of the archaic life without the possibility of road parole sentence. See, no one should be the recipient of criminal behavior, and people who once behaved as criminals can change. If you do not wish to be harmed, do not harm others. And when you lock someone up, don't throw the key away. Words make us free. Who also cannot express himself is in prison. Whoever cannot express himself is in prison. My thing is creative writing, creative thinking, creative living. I'm gonna teach you about three things as I call it. And that is one, to examine your life. Use writing as a way to be more present in your life and to understand what your life's about. The other thing is evoking. Get depth, get into emotional seas. The source of your rage is a deep sorrow. Get to that. The third thing is to express. How do you express it? How do you express it where people can get it? How do you find a poem out of it? How do you get a short story? Because one thing is you get to that depth, but then if you can find a way in which it becomes art, it becomes a place where people can be arrested aesthetically. And for that moment, you're in that internal place where music and art and poetry and all that come together and you're in that spiritual internal space that everybody can feel alive. And to me, that's what I want to get into. So expression becomes uh, very important. Art saved me. It was amazing, a sudden state that wasn't waiting. It saw me waving, I'm suffocating. I needed oxygen, it gave me resuscitation. Like the Heimlich, I'm choking. My thoughts is provoked, my focus. My pen is filled with the blood of the hopeless. Using these sacred, insatiable statements, creating my savior with my art. Amen. What I really wanted to know is they are a work of art. Their lives are a work of art. And their masterpiece is really them. It's about change, not just the guys you're working with, but society. Can we change society so we don't throw away our young people, so we don't throw away people? And if they have so much trouble, that that trouble can still be worked with, that we can take them from trauma to transformation. That, to me, is my goal in the long run. Check me. Hi, I'm Good Group. Amazing to report to the job. Rehearsal underway for the play, I'm Good. It's an acronym that stands for incarcerated men getting over obstacles daily. I'm Good, written and produced by these actors. It's a blessing. I mean, it really is a blessing. The Playwrights Project is a privilege. Good behavior gets and keeps you in the class. It's a process. It wasn't about perfection. Inside the cement walls and over the barbed wire fence live ideas. Ideas inspired by real life. Whatever comes to my heart, I'm just going to write it down. And, and that's what I did, you know. And, and I started to, when I started writing, I started to see that, um, I learned a lot about myself, you know, how the, the pains and the struggles that I went through. I was entrenched early on with uh, gang drugs and I fed into it. Out of the eight aspiring Shakespeare's who shared their story with me, five are serving life sentences for mostly murder. The past is not who I, you know, I am today. They all crave to still make something of themselves. We all wanted to, uh, to let society know that we weren't just, we we're human beings. They made some terrible mistakes in life. And we're trying to rectify those. We're trying to make amends and restitution for what we did. Much of the play centers on the struggles of life under lock and key, the factors that led to incarceration, and the powerful role of compassion in rehabilitation. There is hope for these guys in here that we're not just uh, some people that are just left to rot for the rest of their lives. How do you make a man, make the pain go away? After the shame and misery I've caused along the way, to say I'm sorry, it's not enough, it's not enough. Make me a better man, to make amends, to make things right. Time goes on, you know, it only goes to show.
So I had my first experience with gel guitar doors at the California Rehabilitation Center over seven years ago. And since that time, I have seen so many inmates go through this program. And it is one of the most meaningful programs that the Department of Corrections has allowed us to offer. These individuals, some of them didn't know they had the ability to play music. And although some may not play music very well, they had no idea they had the ability to share their story and memorialize their experience in writing. And so it's given them hope. It's given them an opportunity to express what this experience of incarceration has done for them. It's also given them a chance to share uh, their voice with the world. So this is an impactful program and our goal is to make sure that it continues at our institution and that it sh it's shared abroad. So I would like to thank Wayne Kramer and his staff for giving us this opportunity to really do meaningful work and to really put the R in rehabilitation for the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. We founded the company in 1984 to marry social issues and the idea of both personal and social change to the arts. I started gathering stories, mostly from young people, and creating musicals out of them. The transition time came when we took those shows into the detention center. Pretend that you were being interviewed. The first question they ask you is, what did you do to get locked up? They want to look at you in your criminal past, right? You want to control the narrative. Who are you? People should join story catchers because it's a family. It's not just a place for you to come to work. You build relationships. You get resources that can help you in ways that you don't expect them to help you. Story catchers basically tells you, we see your struggles. We want to help you. And you also have opportunities for growth, personally and professionally. I'm Janessa Johnsrud and I'm a faculty member at Del Arte International School of Physical Theater and I'm also an arts and corrections teacher at Pelican Bay State Prison. In the spring of 2016, Del Arte partnered with the William James Association Prison Arts Program to start bringing theater classes as part of the arts and corrections programming. We started with four students in the minimum security facility and now we have students on all, all the yards. Personally, I didn't know what to expect going in. I had never been in a prison before, and to go to a place like Pelican Bay that's a level four, it's a really intense environment. And the act of even getting inside to the, the space that we teach in is arduous. It's essentially a cage. You do? Are you ready? There it is. As a, someone who's really into psychology, right, I think that um, there's many forms of healing. As adults, I think we get um, accustomed to dealing with our problems in a certain way. So probably violence. And we, we don't know how to deal emotionally. And in the arts, you can kind of, you know, convey that. You know, in painting, you can throw your emotions on paint. Uh, in writing, you can put it out, out in a poem, in a story. In theater, you can just let it go. And for this, while we're here, we can, you know, release our anger through our acting. My name is Zuska Sabata. I'm the Arts Engagement Director at Del Arte, and I am co-founder and co-lead on Del Arte's prison project at Pelican Bay State Prison. It's a pretty interesting process to go through, starting out with a lot of assumptions. Yeah, TV is not an accurate representation of reality, I will say that. Physically being there was definitely intimidating at first. I'm stepping into a space that is characterized by an expected high level of violence. Prisoners are stigmatized in our society. We tend to deduce people down to their crime, that they're bad people because they're in prison. Once you're inside and working with them, it's like, these are people, these are humans, these are guys. That's what I love about doing theater in a place like the abandoned chow hall in a level four security prison is that you can transform the space. That ritual lends itself to finding a, a way to escape being in there almost for a moment.
We're delighted to have Mr. Reggie Austin join the group. I met Frank in two places. I met him here and outside for a while. And he was getting ready for his way out the door and I was starting a lot of things. He's the man who taught me how to shoot the gun. The concert itself put me in a situation to where I was amongst a group of musicians who just accepted me for, for who I was and my skill. After so many years in prison, you know, it was like a breath of fresh air. It, it was like being reborn. That longing that you have when you do something that you haven't really been able to do the way that you really do it in a long time. That event happened after I had been to the board the last time, which I had been denied five years, after doing 30. And so it's not that my spirit was low, but my spirit was burdened down. That event really affected me in a positive way. It put life back in me. Reggie Austin. Reggie Austin. You know, Frank was always amenable and opened the door. I'm, I'm a bit younger, you know, but he was one of those people that inspired me to play jazz and to keep playing jazz because my background was basically classical in the beginning. I'm a professional musician. Would you mind telling me what brought you to start? I have a second degree murder. And how long have I been here? 33 years. <laughs> Are you ever getting out? I should have been out in 1991. My sentence is only 15 to life, which you do 10 years on. But, you know, politics and the way things are right now is what's kept us in prison. You can't take away from the seriousness of the crimes that some of us are here for, but it's an affront to the American system of justice, some of the things that are going on when it pertains to prisoners. I grew up in a time where drugs were everywhere. I grew up in the 60s. But then someone introduced me to heroin. And that changed my life. Uh, it took all the things that I loved away. I was angry about that. I didn't know how to say I needed help because I didn't know I was sick. I thought I was just still getting by.
Hi, I'm Deborah Postel. I'm the co-founding and executive director of Women Wonder Writers and co-creator of The Right of Your Life, which is a 12-week after-school writing, empathy building, cultural arts program that we do here in Riverside County. And Women Wonder Writers believes um, and strives to break the cycle of victimization and abuse and also transform our criminal justice system. Ever since 2011, uh, we've been helping kids, uh, pretty much serving in after-school programs, uh, weekly programming of about 200 kids per year annually. And we focus on ages 14 to 17 in our signature program called The Right of Your Life, which is an after-school arts writing and mentoring program. After the course of uh, completing their program, they would have completed one publishable artwork, one publishable writing, as well as an empathy building project, team project, and a speech. And we hope to encourage resilience in all the kids that we work with. And we have many uh, partners that we collaborate with, including group homes, public and private agencies, government agencies, probation, Riverside District Attorney's Office and uh, many corporate sponsors that help us. We have a team of volunteers and partner with the local universities like the University of California at Riverside as well as Cal Baptist University. And uh, we're honored to have uh, many people to support our program.